Hello, everyone. My name is Kyle. I want to welcome you to Uplift and to Conversation. We're in a series called Pray Like This. Pray Like This. I'll tell you where this comes from. I've told you this in every message, but I want to remind us again. It comes from a phrase from Jesus in Matthew chapter 6 when his disciples ask him to be taught how to pray. They didn't ask Jesus to be taught how to preach. They asked to be taught how to pray. And this is Jesus' response. When you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they'll be heard for their many words. Don't be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this. Jesus said, don't pray with embellishments. We don't need those. You don't have to impress anybody with your prayers. Speak from your soul. Pray like this. So what the Lord does from there is He teaches them a prayer to pray. We call it the Lord's Prayer, and as is our custom here at Uplift, let's read this out loud together, beginning in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Let me hear you. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into testing, but deliver us from evil. And as the King James Version ends, let me hear you. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I always want to say for thine. Did you learn it that way in the King James English? For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. It's a simple prayer. It's how Jesus taught his disciples to pray. And what it does is it betrays our own desperation for God. We're going to switch now, and we're going to go to Luke chapter 11. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there if you want. We're going to be in Luke. I'm going to bounce around in a couple of places in this message. And we're going to zero in and focus on Jesus' teaching on prayer as Luke records it. There's some, there's some differences, but the, the, the message and the motive is the same. So the wording is a little different in those two chapters from Matthew chapter 6 and 7 and Luke chapter 11, but I think you're going to see why we're doing this. In Luke chapter 11, verse 13, Jesus poses a very provocative question. Now, for those of us who are seasoned in Scripture, we probably see the words of Jesus and we just kind of pass right over them. We've read them a thousand times and they don't really have, they don't lodge in our soul the way they used to. So I want us to create some distance from this passage just for a minute. And I want us to see what Jesus actually asks here in Luke chapter 11. It's pretty provocative when we generate some distance. This is what he says. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? It's ludicrous. Verse 12, or if his son asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. Those are shocking statements by Jesus. Here's verse 13. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This is a provocative question. What good dad would would play such a cruel prank on his children, to give him things that would kill him when he asks for things that could help him. In Jesus' teaching on prayer in the Gospel of Luke, what Jesus does here, as he did in Matthew, is he pivots our gaze from the mundane to the celestial. There's a really hard gear shift here for those of us that know how to drive manuals. Jesus is not content with mere physical, tangible responses from God. We want those things. In my family, I've got multiple things over which I'm praying right now that I want physical, tangible results, things that I think we should have. Jesus, though, pivots hard from that. And what he does is he directs our attention to the divine bestowment of the Holy Spirit. That's what he says. That's what he says here is the result of prayer. It's as if he's unveiling a, a hidden gem among the mundane clutter of our desire. So in this really hard gear shift, Jesus unveils in this chapter, in Luke chapter 11, a 
fundamental truth, and it's this, that the Holy Spirit is the crown jewel of the Father's benevolence. Of all the things that God gives, this is the pinnacle. This is the pinnacle. The very essence of His love poured out on His children is the Holy Spirit of all things. So Jesus teaches us that in our, that, that in our prayers, that even though they're, they're designed for us to ask and to seek God and to seek things, above all else, our prayers are designed for us to seek the indwelling of the Spirit. That's what Jesus says here. That's the point of prayer. For in the presence of the Spirit, all other blessings find their fulfillment. Everything else. Every other request finds its fulfillment first in the giving of the Spirit. And in this response to prayer from God, our souls find their truest home. Because first of all, this, the Holy Spirit's a gift. It's a gift through prayer. And the value of this gift is palpable. In fact, Jesus refers to it with two words. He calls it the promise. The promise. Skip in your Bibles to Luke chapter 24, verse 49. Now, this is at the end of the Gospel of Luke. And at the very end, this is after Jesus' resurrection. And it's before His ascension. He's spending time with the apostles. In fact, you're going to find something pretty interesting the way that Luke tells this, is that the first time, the first in the Gospel of Luke, not in all the New Testament, but in the Gospel of Luke, if you just put blinders on and you just read the Gospel of Luke, the first time that the apostles and the disciples worship Jesus is in this chapter at the very end of the Gospel. It's the first time they do it. Now, they do it at other times in other Gospels, but in Luke, this is when he says the realization that Jesus is God comes at this moment. So in this conversation... Before his ascension, Jesus says this to his apostles. It's in verse 49. He says this, I am sending the promise, the promise of my Father upon you. And then he says, stay in the city until you're clothed with this power from on high. Until you get it. I am sending the promise. This is the end of his gospel, right? Jesus is resurrected. He's soon to return to the Father, but he's not going to leave without offering this reassurance. And what he says is that everything that he's promised to the disciples will happen. It will happen. The Father will give what he's promised. And with that comes a presence that's not always defined, but it's certainly calculated. In fact, we've, we've talked about this here at Uplift. The word for spirit can also and just as easily be translated as breath. So Jesus promises this holy breath to his, his apostles, this new breath. What he says is you're going to breathe the air of heaven. This is coming. I promise that you're going to get it. And this is the divine pledge of God's paternal love and where God's paternal love finds its ultimate expression. Now, in contemplating this, it's really inconceivable to imagine a loftier gift given to us than the very Spirit, the very breath of God, to be given the life force of God, to be given of the very thing that animates his own experience and his own existence. Now, we're kind of getting off into the philosophical and the theoretical, but that's what this is. It's the breath of, it's the very breath of God. So let's just be honest for a minute. We can't really understand, or we can't really contemplate such a gift that we're offered a glimpse into the depths of this divine love, but we know that it calls us and it beckons us into a deeper communion with God knowing that as Jesus teaches this, prayer is the vehicle through which we receive this gift. The gift, the Spirit, is given through prayer. Second of all, the Holy Spirit is our right. It's our right through prayer. Now, let's go back in the Gospel of Luke to Luke chapter 3. I told you we're going to be here for a little while, so let's go to Luke chapter 3. If you have it in your Bibles, you can turn there. And what I want us to do is I want us to focus and zero in on the baptism of Jesus. So Luke chapter 3, we're going to read verses 21 and 22. Now listen to what Luke says. Now when all the people were baptized, 
John the Baptist is there, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized, and he was praying, the heavens were open, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, and it said, You are my beloved Son. With you, I'm well pleased. That's a pretty sacred moment. It's got a different feeling here than it does in other places of the gospel. Luke is telling us something. He, he captures something in the way he writes of Jesus' baptism. He captures something very organic. Two things actually converge here at Jesus' baptism. First is the declaration of God that Jesus is his son. That's a big deal. People are hearing that. Jesus is his son. But two, and for our sake, it's this. The Spirit descending on Jesus. And Luke uses an interesting phrase here. He said that it descended in bodily form like a dove. In bodily form like a dove. Now that sounds like somebody who's writing something they can't really describe. They don't know how to describe it. Luke wrote though with these phrases that something could be visibly, physically seen. That's what he's saying. And it looked like, it looked like the descent of a dove. That's what he says. Something like in bodily form, like a dove, fell on Jesus. Luke's not talking in metaphors here. He's not talking in metaphors. He's not saying that Jesus was enlightened by some mystical experience. What, what Luke writes here is that a concrete, objective reality occurred. Something happened that could be seen. Something happened. In other words, these two moments of the declaration of Jesus' sonship and the filling of His Spirit all came together in Jesus' relationship to God as a son to a father was certified by the Spirit of God. Paul took this literally, by the way. Paul took this literally. I told you we're going to stay in Luke, but I'm going to jump to Galatians chapter 4. Look what Paul writes about this. He says this, Because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then you're an heir through God. Now, kings mold their heirs. They mold their children. God does the same. That's what this is. We're shaped by the Father. And this formation happens through the gift and the right of his own spirit. And listen, as his children, this is the point. The spirit is our right. It's our inheritance. I don't want these semantics to frustrate you. It's not that God owes us anything. But if he calls us children, then the natural thing he's going to do is give us of his spirit. It's our right as his children. In fact, this was the ultimate aim of God through Jesus. That's what this is all about. This was and is the culmination of his redemptive mission to secure for us access to the breath and the Spirit of God. That's what this is all for. Because the Spirit provides the conduit through which the boundlessness of life from the Father flows to us. That's what this means. And Jesus makes this amazing statement in Luke chapter 11 that prayer activates this. It activates this. And our communion with the Father, our worship of the Father, is the intimacy required for God to breathe in us this new life with new purpose and new direction and new relationships and new conversations. Our prayers, our prayers are filled with multiple requests. But Jesus says that this is what we're given. We need to recognize that. This is what the Lord gives. And the third thing is that the Holy Spirit is our pursuit through prayer. Now, it's a gift and it's a right, but it's also the thing we chase. It's also the thing we chase. Let's read again from Luke chapter 11, verse 13. If you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give 
the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. Jesus, he drops a pretty profound truth here, more so than what we are given. He teaches that the pursuit of God's gift of life is the paramount focus of prayer. It's what it's all about. It's what it's all about. Now, we come to God with requests of healing, and we should. And we, re- we come to God with requests of provision, and we absolutely should. He's our Father. But the pursuit of this gift is really what prayer is for. Because in Jesus, in Jesus resides the entirety of divine grace and truth from which we continually receive grace upon grace. And yet it's the Holy Spirit who serves as this divine conduit, the, the appointed conveyor tasked with making the blessings of Jesus personally and intimately ours and transforming them into these tangible experiences of a fresh and invigorating and abundant life. The Holy Spirit's the very essence of life in Jesus. It's a provision so magnificent that it mirrors the wonder of the life it gives and What I'm going to ask of us is to surrender ourselves completely to the guidance of the Spirit and allowing the the Spirit, the presence of God, the breath of God, allowing allowing Him to have unfettered access to our hearts and our souls. And when that happens, you're going to see wonders being worked in your life. And how you know that happens is that your prayer starts to change. Your prayer starts to change. Our Our sense of desperation changes when we realize that this is the gift we receive, the right and then the inheritance that we receive. This is the answer. Now listen carefully. This, the Holy Spirit, is the answer for which we may not ask, but it's the answer we desperately need. Prayer is designed to draw us to the Father's throne. Now you kind of get a sense of when Paul says to pray without ceasing. Paul tapped into that. He knew exactly what he was getting when he prayed. Look, we, we receive blessing and grace and favor, but our, our soul thirsts for more than the tangible, for a greater outpouring of the very spirit of the one who designed and created and formed us. Prayer attunes us to this frequency and makes us eager to receive the Holy Spirit in greater measure. I want you to consider something. I'm going to run through a list of titles of the Spirit found in the New Testament. So you'll kind of get a a, a 360 glimpse of what this is. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29, the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Grace. It unveils and bestows upon us the fullness of grace found in Jesus. Paul calls it the Holy Spirit, the spirit of faith in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. It guides us in the journey of belief from its inception to its maturity. In Romans chapter 8, verse 15, Paul calls the spirit the spirit of adoption. It's this assurance that a affirms our status as God's children and instills with us the trusting cry that we can call God our Father. Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 14, calls it the Spirit of glory. The Holy Spirit serves as the earnest of our inheritance, offering us a foretaste of the eternal splendor that awaits us. And John, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 6, calls the Holy Spirit the Spirit of truth. Well, we need the Spirit of truth that illuminates the path to all truth, and it makes every word of God a living reality in our lives. So it's the spirit of prayer. He enables our communion with the Father, ensuring that our petitions find a ready audience in heaven. He's the spirit of discernment and conviction. He penetrates the depths of our hearts, and he leads us to sanctification. This is what we pursue because it's a daily grind. It's a daily struggle. We chase this. And prayer with, it, with this intent makes us want this even more. And we know from this that prayer is really, it's really meant to change us rather than just changing our situation. That's what Jesus says here. Getting the Holy Spirit is the way that we're changed. That's what it means. And it's in such a prayer that's marked by 
a believing thanksgiving and a steadfast persistence that our souls become receptive for the Spirit to take complete and unhindered possession. And it's through such prayer that we not only ask and hope, but we lay hold and we retain and inherit the fullness of this blessing. Listen, we have one certainty here in this human life, and it's this. The Father ardently desires to fill us with His Spirit, and He delights in giving it to us. That's what He wants. And once we grasp this truth, and we've learned to believe it for ourselves, then we'll lean into the confidence to intercede for this gift, not just for us, but on our church, upon the world, on our family, upon specific endeavors. Fill these people with your Spirit, God. Fill this church with your Spirit. Fill my family with your Spirit. I want you to listen to me. The person who's come to know the Father intimately in prayer for themselves also learns to pray with utmost confidence for others. We want others to feel this. For the Father gives the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him. And He does so not least, but most when they intercede on behalf of others. I ask and encourage you to pray and receive the Holy Spirit.